Hey everyone, this is lecture 9.3, Diversity and Gender Identity. The main thing we're talking about here is sexual orientation and gender identity, but also all of the phenomena surrounding those concepts. So, uh, the simple definition of sexual orientation is who you want to have sex with or uh, how you do or don't want to have sex. Examples of sexual orientation are asexual, bisexual, heterosexual, homosexual, and pansexual. We'll work through most of those over the course of this lecture. Alfred Kinsey, who was a zoologist in the first part of the 20th century, was actually intensely influential in the early study of human sexual behavior. Uh, Kinsey's major contrib he had two major contributions uh, to our understanding of human sexuality. The first of which is the concept of a continuum of sexual orientation. Now given uh, this idea is a bit dated uh, because it comes from the early 1950s, but because it was so utterly revolutionary for its time, it still is very useful today. The idea here being, uh, the big idea being that there are people who aren't heterosexual in the world. Uh, in the 1950s, that was a big uh, revelation. Uh, but also, there are in-between gradations between heterosexual and homosexual, right? So uh, you, it isn't an all or nothing proposition. And again, today, that's kind of obvious. But for that era, that was a big deal. Uh, his concept of the Kinsey scale of sexuality, uh, wherein zero is exclusively heterosexual and six is exclusively homosexual, um, really illustrates uh, some of the more complex points Kinsey was making. Uh, you will note, uh, there's a couple things here, uh, interesting uh, concepts. Uh, three uh, is a person who is, is equally heterosexual and homosexual. In our modern uh, language, we would say that that person is either bisexual or pansexual. Um, the concept there being additionally is that most people who identify as either bisexual or pansexual are probably not threes there, but probably range somewhere between two and four. So, and if you talk to uh, people who are uh, bisexual, they will tell you, yes, I uh, can be sexually attracted to either men or women, but I have a preference for women. Uh, I, I won't not date a man, but I have a preference for women. Or vice versa, I will date a man, uh, a woman, but I have a preference for men. Uh, so uh, that, depending on uh, what the person's gender identity is, can range them from two to four then. Uh, addition, yet, yet further, additionally, uh, Kinsey would posit that those of us who identify as being either heterosexual or homosexual are probably not perfect zeros or perfect sixes, but uh, if we were put in a certain dynamic social situation, we could be either ones or fives. So if you're someone that identifies as being heterosexual, you could maybe be put into a social situation where you may have a romantic relationship with somebody uh, who is of your same sex, even if you don't necessarily identify as not being heterosexual. A really good piece of evidence for this is uh, sexual behavior that we see among prison inmates. Uh, the fact that when people uh, are forced to be among people of all their same sex, uh, then uh, their, uh, that kind of situation can cause uh, human sexual activity, uh, that same-sex sexual activity that wouldn't normally be found in people. That kind of extreme situation then uh, can lead people to maybe uh, go from being a zero to being a one, just kind of incidentally, right? Incidental is the key there. It happens because of the, the due to the situation. Uh, additionally then, uh, for uh, people who identify as being homosexual, there could be similar social situations that may uh, drive that person to maybe flexing into be, being a five territory. Uh, again, very big ideas for the early 1950s. Uh, additionally then, uh, tied in with Kinsey's ideas 
are is the the idea that sexual orientation could shift over the life course and there are many dynamic uh explanations for this including uh social situations you could be put into or uh, maybe biological situations you'd be put into uh, maybe uh, due to the aging process uh, your uh, the chemical uh, makeup of your body or your brain shifts in some way and then uh, your sexual preferences or even your um, your inclination to have sex at all uh, shifts in some way uh, that uh, is accounted for there uh, what is debated among theorists is not so much that it could shift over the life course that's relatively well established but what is more debated is how quickly does that transition occur? Is that something that uh, we sit down in class and then by the time you get up in class, then your sexual orientation is shifted? That's probably unlikely. Or is it more of a matter of years or decades or longer in which our sexuality shifts? Um, that's, that's something that is kind of debated a bit amongst uh, scholars in this regard. Gender identity then, its simple definition is your identity based on the relationship between your sex assigned at birth and your psychological gender. So examples of gender identity include uh, being a cisgender male, so somebody whose uh, biology matches that identity. Uh, most of us are uh, in society uh, by matter of statistics are cisgender. Uh, cisgender female, non-binary, uh, agender individuals, people that do not feel that they have uh, a gender at all, um, which is different from being non-binary, uh, transgender males, and then transgender females. These are all uh, examples of gender identity, and it's not. This is not an all-inclusive list. These are just the gender identities we most frequently talk about. It should be noted that gender identity and sexual orientation are markedly different things. And I think I do mention this later in the lecture, but let's talk about it again. So, a being a transgender person is not a sexual orientation because transgender men for example, can be bisexual, they can be pansexual, heterosexual, homosexual, um, because it's about their relationship between their brain and their body. Uh, thus, um, it, it doesn't have to do with who you want to have sex with. If you have questions on that, please feel free to email me about it, because it a, it's a complex idea. So let's move into talking a bit more about uh, sexual orientation uh, and this this thing that my friend Lauren, who does a lot of uh, advocacy in this regard, calls the gay alphabet soup. Uh, and that is uh, that's a relatively common kind of joke is that there are so many letters to this thing. You probably know, uh, you, you almost definitely know LGBT, uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender. Uh, but LGBTQ plus is becoming more common and we'll talk about that a little bit more. But also there is IAAPQ, which is why the plus got added onto that. We'll, we'll now move through these for the probably most of the remainder of this lecture. So uh, that Q then, uh, the Q in, in addition, uh, the plus itself are good catch-alls, right? If you want to talk about this, uh, this community of people, this diverse community, queer can be a word that could you be used uh, when you want to talk about everybody. It also can be used to describe people that don't feel they fit into any of those categories. So that can be helpful for people as well. However, because the word queer was once and still in some places is used as a slur, if you are not comfortable using it, you probably shouldn't be using it. Um, as with all slurs, and when we talk about this, we could talk about uh, slurs surrounding sexuality, slurs surrounding ethnicity or race, whatever. You always have to remember that for some people in the world, um, this word has been yelled at them during 
the most terrifying either psychologically or physically moment in their lives, right? That's the nature of uh, slurs. So, um, so it's, it's care we have to be careful when using these words. And we, especially if you aren't a member of the community, we can't, we have to use them very, very carefully, uh, just really as a matter of respect. Intersex people are people who are born with combinations of male or female parts. And intersex people are a population that is um, often greatly overlooked. Uh, these people, uh, this can be caused by a range of biological conditions. Uh, this is something that can happen uh, in, utero, in utero while a woman is pregnant with a baby. Uh, this could occur after the child is born. It could be because of uh, a chromosomal uh, condition, so due to their DNA. It could be because of a uh, issue in somebody's body chemistry or a hormonal issue. Uh, regardless, these people are biologically somewhere between male and female. Uh, please never use the term hermaphrodite to refer to intersex people. Uh, this was once more common. Uh, it is now uh, considered really unacceptable uh, and insulting, uh, largely because the term hermaphrodite is used to describe uh, certain types of animals, right? And uh, it actually isn't even accurate for humans. So a hermaphroditic organism is something like a certain fish can be hermaphroditic, uh, certain um, in, uh, invertebrates, so types of slugs and worms can be hermaphroditic. These are organisms that can either shift their sex when needed for reproductive reasons, or they produce both male and female uh, cells, so eggs or sperm. And neither of those apply to people who are intersex. Uh, so it not only is dehumanizing, but it's bio biologically completely inaccurate. Uh, so intersex people uh, range from, estimates are that they're about 0.5% of the population to 1.7% of the population. Our estimates on how many uh, intersex people there are in the world is actually uh, probably artificially low. Uh, because many intersex people may not actually even be aware that they are intersex. And this is a deeply unfortunate artifact uh, of kind of gender constructions. Uh, traditionally in the United States, and this almost definitely does still happen in some places, uh, when a child was born intersex, um, it was common procedure to immediately take that child away from the parents and do a very quick surgery to quote unquote fix the situation. Depending on whatever the doctor perceived the quote unquote right sex would be, they would either cut something off or sew something up and basically doing kind of a very sloppy uh, sex change uh, operation um, in that moment. Uh, sometimes that more or less worked. In many cases, it very much did not work. And uh, then uh, due to the individual's biology and adolescence, it created then additional problems. Uh, so uh, because of that sort of thing, there are many people who may be intersex but don't actually know that they were born intersex. Um, to put this into uh, this percentage into perspective, uh, that 0.5% to 1.7% of the population is pretty close to the number of people that are born with red hair and bright green eyes. Uh, it's it's about that percentage of uh, the the population um, similar to intersex people. Uh, intersex people just are not one of the more visible elements of the LGBTQ plus community. Uh, that going along with asexual people who we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, so um, they're one of the more unfortunately invisible populations here. 
allies. Uh, the relationship uh, between heter heterosexual sympathizers and friends and the LGBTQ plus community uh, is quite complex. Uh, the exact role of allies in the community has sometimes been controversial. Uh, there was, it was mu once much less common for gay bars, for example, to be fully accepting of straight people coming in. And those were from moments of uh, protecting themselves, right, is what a lot of that comes down to. Now, those barriers have broken down, luckily, over time. But, um, but that concept of the space that is safe for people really was very um, important for a long time. Additionally, then, the definition of being an ally has changed over time. When I was in college, um, it was in the early 2000s, it was considered kind of an out there thing for a heterosexual person to have friends or be okay with gay people. That's how far we have come. So to openly be okay with gay people in the early 2000s, that's what it classified as being an ally then was. Now in our current moment, uh, to be an ally has shifted. So now to be an ally, and this came along with our advances in concepts of what privilege is and isn't, uh, to be an ally now, both of uh, LGBTQ plus people, but also uh, uh, black people, women, any minority group. To be an ally is to be outside of that group, but to use your privilege that you have to assist that group, right? Uh, that's what being an ally today means. Um, and there are some very interesting conversations outside of LGBTQ plus people. Uh, when you look at uh, movements like Black Lives Matter, there are some interesting conversations about like, what is the role of white people in Black Lives Matter and what that really means and the strategy of that. Uh, so if you're interested in that concept of allyship, uh, go look there because it's, it's pretty interesting. Pansexual people then are uh, it's described as being attracted to personality, not to body type. Uh, that is uh, this uh, sexuality there. And uh, pansexuality and asexuality can be kind of difficult for some, harder for people to understand who are not pansexual or is asexual. They are attracted to the personality of the individual. In contrast then, bisexual people are attracted to certain types of people, just like uh, heterosexuals, for example. So bisexual people, it's best described, are, are attracted to the body, while pansexual people are attracted to the personality of the individual. Uh, pansexuals then uh, is uh, could be attracted hypothetically to anyone. Now, does that mean they want to have sex with everyone? Certainly not. Uh, we're just talking about the, the scope of potential partners for the individual. Uh, the, the key that has been driven home to me by my pansexual friends is that it's about the personality of the person. It is not about the body of the person. Questioning people then. Uh, these are people who are unsure of their sexuality. Now, often when we talk about questioning individuals, we're often talking about youth. So we're talking about uh, often when, when, we, when we figure out our sexuality is when we're in our teens. That's for most of us. Uh, some people know earlier, some people know later, but most uh, times when you see that second cue for questioning, that is usually in conversations surrounding teens. There's an organization uh, that I uh, have worked with in the past called the Kaleidoscope Youth Center that uh, helps out uh, teens who are trying to figure out their sexuality or teens that fully know their sexuality that are somewhere in the LGBTQ plus community. Those people um, often have that cue in there just to make it a little bit more inclusive for people that want to come to their events, right? There's an element of that there. 
And also, they would also talk about allyship there too. They would absolutely include that ally A in there, but also maybe to help a teen kind of, you know, if they want to try out going on a date with someone, uh, then those events would be okay too. That's where that Q questioning comes in. You don't frequently see that with, in groups oriented toward adults, but um, sometimes you could. Now, trans people. Uh, trans people, uh, transgender is still an okay term uh, for reference, but a trans person is somebody who feels that their gender does not fit with the social norms imposed on them. Being trans is not a sexual orientation, as I alluded to, but a gender identity. Being asexual, heterosexual, bisexual, pansexual, homosexual, those are sexual orientations, while being transgender is uh, about the relationship between your brain and your body. Uh, transsexual, then, is a term that was once commonly used in these conversations, but now has become obsolete. This is because people who were defined as being transsexual were people who felt the need to seek some sort of gender reassignment, right? And many people still do seek gender reassignment surgery, particularly surgery, but um, it is not, it is seen today as being more of a private matter that a trans person doesn't need to talk to people about, right? A lot of this has to do with the fact that for a long time, non-trans people, including uh, gay people, not just heterosexuals, non-trans people would only ask trans people about their surgery stuff, right? And you can imagine how awkward it would be for somebody that you just met to suddenly ask you about the condition of your genitals, right? That's weird, right? Um, if someone came up to me and started asking me about my penis, that's strange, right? Um, and we all have people in our lives that we, maybe you do, that you would have those conversations with, but it was an overwhelming and intensely weird thing for trans people. So that's why that has gone away. Um, Laverne Cox, uh, the trans actor, has actually done an amazing, uh, some amazing interviews surrounding uh, why we need to move away from uh, that concept of transsexuality and thinking of trans people as uh, almost sexual objects in that regard. Uh, so she's done a, a lot of good work in that regard, if you want to Google that. Now, um, are concepts of non-binary, agender, and gender fluid are pretty new ideas. So this is something that could become obsolete relatively quickly, but the current thinking then is that non-binary people as in people who feel that their gender identity cannot be placed into a male, female, or other category. Non-binary people then are a, a certain uh, type of trans person, right? And then additionally then, a non-binary people can be agender, they can be gender fluid, and really um, so agender is a non-binary person who has no specific gender identity or having a neutral gender identity. That's what it means to be a non-binary agender. And then uh, gender fluid then are people who uh, at different moments, different social situations, their, their gender may shift and their gender identity may shift. Um, that's where, where that comes in. Um, there is a very good article here linked at the bottom of uh, the slide if you want to read uh, more about that because this is a, a complex concept and it is probably it is something that will definitely shift in one way or another over the next, I'd say, at least five years. That, that would be a long period of time for that not to shift. Asexual people then are people who are not driven by sex. Um, this is 
generally considered to be a non-binary variant. Uh, this does not mean that asexual people uh, can't have sex or that they don't necessarily find pleasure in sex. That really varies from one asexual person to another asexual person. Additionally, then, it doesn't mean that asexual people can't be interested in romantic relationships. They can't have families, etc. Uh, I have a good friend uh, who is asexual and uh, is a, a mother of two children, and uh, they are uh, married uh, to married to a man. So um, that, that's what that can kind of look like. Uh, they. Uh, my friend just simply is not driven by sex the way uh, many of us are. Uh, and again, that is a concept because sexuality and, and the, the primal urge for sex is so central to many of us. It's a, not, it's a tough idea to wrap your head around. Um, it's, it's estimated that the asexual population may be somewhere around 1%. Very similar to intersex people, though, it may be that many asexual people don't really know that they're asexual. It may be that many asexual people are in relationships where um, they are living, they're living romantic lives with people, and um, they're just sex just isn't an important thing for them. Is what that comes down to. And then we have uh, some other trans terms. Uh, the transition, as I alluded to, uh, is uh, when a person does choose to change their physical parts. Uh, so the term the transition is okay. Just avoid that term transsexual. Uh, so the transition can include hormones, surgery, a social transition. It can include all of those. It can include just one of those. Um, and... Uh, so for what that's worth. Uh, cisgender people, as I did allude to, but let's give that official definition, are individuals whose gender identity matches the sex that they are born with. So most people in society, as a matter of statistics, are cisgender. Uh, being Calling someone cisgender is not an insulting term. It was when we first, as a society, um, started using this term, somewhat misused on the internet a bit, but it is not intended to be, it, and it isn't an insulting term, it's just a descriptor of the nature of your brain with your body. Uh, and that is kind of it. So if, uh, there's a lot of big ideas here. So if anyone has any questions, uh, please feel free to send me an email or get in contact with me otherwise. Thanks so much.